Today's lecture is by Paul Klutz. Dr. Klutz is Associate Director of Patient Outcome in the Oncology Center of Excellence at the FDA. He joined the FDA in 2010, focusing on GU malignancies. Dr. Klutz is a board certified medical oncologist and internist. He completed his medical oncology fellowship at the National Cancer Institute here at Bethesda. Dr. Klutz received his BS from the University of Colorado Boulder and his medical degree from the University of Pittsburgh. He completed emergency room internship at the University of Maryland, followed by internal medicine residency at the University of Maryland. I'm sure you will enjoy his presentation today. Hello, my name is Paul Klutz. I'm a medical oncologist and the deputy director in the Oncology Center of Excellence at the Food and Drug Administration. And today I'm pleased to be able to give you a lecture about crossing the finish line in drug development and how evidence is generated for uh, review by the FDA and hopefully approval of a novel a drug or biologic therapy in, in this uh, instance for cancer products, uh, which is what I regulate. A little bit of background is that I actually was a, a medical oncologist fellow over at the National Cancer Institute. So I have um, a familiarity with the NIH and the NCI. And so I'm really happy to be able to speak to, to you and, and teach you a little bit about drug development um, I will tell you that the FDA has been an amazing place for me to work, and so I would urge uh, early career uh, scientists to check out the FDA as an op opportunity for either fellowships or, or even for careers. Uh, it's been pretty remarkable. So I will walk through these slides. Um, I have no financial relationships to disclose. My hope uh, is that um, I give you a good understanding of the FDA, uh, how we approve drugs and biologics, using again oncology as a therapeutic example. But I think the core principles that I'll be discussing, you know, you should be able to use across therapeutic areas. So at the end of this lecture, I'd like you to be able to describe the FDA and its role in drug development, um, have an understanding of the two types of approval pathways we use in the US, be able to characterize efficacy endpoints and think about how to, how to look at a, the strength of an, of an efficacy result understand a little bit about patient-focused drug development, measurement of symptoms and function, and what we're doing to make trials more patient-friendly, and then end on how we source our evidence uh, and can we find opportunities to make data generation um, more efficient from routine healthcare. My outline is as follows. I'm gonna start with just overview of FDA and the review of our products. Um, we'll talk about evidence and endpoints, and then we'll get into the patient drug patients uh, and patient-focused drug development, and then we'll talk about real-world data and learning healthcare. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with the Food and Drug Administration. It's, it's uh, a large agency where we have many responsibilities. Um, we are responsible for the safety, efficacy, and security, not just of drugs and biologic products, but also medical devices and food, cosmetics, radiation, tobacco, veterinary. We have a lot of, uh, of things that we do. Um, but there are some things that we don't do. Uh, we don't regulate the cost of products, uh, so we don't know what the cost of a, of a drug or a biologic will be before we review it. And we also don't regulate the practice of medicine. So that is to say that if we approve a new drug uh, for a specific indication, for instance, for prostate cancer, uh, a uh, prescribing physician could use that drug for another type of cancer. It's called off-label use. We don't uh, regulate that. Um, but it is something um, that companies are not allowed to market. There are three key centers at the FDA that review a lot of the drugs uh, and products that are used in cancer. The Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, or CEDAR, evaluates drugs and antibodies. CBER, or the Center for Biologic Evaluation and Research, regulates cellular and gene therapies as well as vaccines. And CDRH, or the Center for Devices and Radiologic Health, will regulate devices in vitro diagnostics and diagnostic and therapeutic radiologics. Now, if you've been following cancer research and development of cancer products, you know that uh, cancer touches these three centers uh, and it's a very active area. Uh, we have many biologic products like CAR T cells, uh, and therapeutic vaccines under development. Clearly, it's been a remarkable decade in drug development for anti-cancer therapies. And with the advent of precision medicine, uh, identifying uh, through in vitro diagnostic tests, populations of cancer uh, patients who will 
benefit greatly from a targeted drug, we interact a lot with the Center for Devices. And so uh, we have a new uh, center, the first inter-center institute uh, that was formed under the 21st Century Cures Act called the Oncology Center of Excellence, recognizing that this therapeutic area of oncology really um, was uh, very active across the centers that having um, an inter-center institute to coordinate the clinical review uh, of all of these products would be helpful. And our vision is to create a unified and collaborative scientific environment to advance development and regulation of oncology products. And so it's been very rewarding to work across all these centers um, for oncology products. Now, one thing I'll mention as uh, someone who works for the Food and Drug Administration now for the last 10 years is that it is quite a balancing act. Uh, and there are many people um, that are either uh, concerned that we are being too cautious or concerned that we are asleep at the wheel. Uh, and uh, it's very hard to find the balance. So I like this slide because it really shows on the x-axis specifically that if you want complete certainty about the safety and the efficacy of a product, it's going to require a lot of data and typically longer trials and more trials. And that's, you know, can cause regulatory burden. And the more and more we ask it go down that road on the x-axis to the right, the more we will be called too cautious, stifling innovation, and there'll be calls to reduce regulatory burden. On the other hand, moving down the x-axis to the left, uh, you know, if we expedite drug development too much and reduce our certainty from having very, very early clinical data, um, clearly we'll reduce regulatory burden. But uh, if we miss a, a small but important uh, safety signal that's infrequent, you could have a toxic death and then it would be considered FDA being asleep at the wheel. So where we are along that continuum um, you know, is very important. And I think currently we're striking a very good balance. On the y-axis, we also uh, need to be consistent in our regulatory decision-making and yet flexible because there's an ever-changing environment of new therapeutics coming out, of new science. Uh, and so that's a balance we have to have. We need to be thorough with our reviews, but we cannot take uh, you know, years to review a product. And so we have to be efficient. Where is that line? Where is the right space in that line? And then finally, with respect to interacting with the outside world, we need to be very independent and conflict-free at the FDA, and we are. But we can't stay within our walls and not reach out and understand what's happening with patients, with industry, uh, with academia. And so you'll see that we are, especially in oncology, quite interactive, uh, working at uh, you know professional society meetings on panels uh, to uncover potential novel approaches to drug development. And that's actually part part of the fun of our job. So let's talk about evidence and endpoints. So. The FDA is really built on two laws as far as drug and biologics. So for drugs, the Food, Drug, and Cosmetics Act um, requires that drugs be safe and effective prior to marketing in the United States. And the Public Health Service Act requires that biologics be safe, pure, and potent. And while there are different laws, the FDA Modernization Act, Modernization Act was enacted to minimize the differences in, in our review between those two. And so for all intents and purposes, for this talk, uh, you know, similar safety and efficacy framework is used uh, and will apply to both biologics and drugs. This is an excellent slide by my friend and colleague, Mark Thierry, that really shows a little bit about how drug development has changed in oncology. This slide currently shows that the classic phase drug development paradigm, where in yellow non-clinical studies are conducted to identify a safe starting dose uh, for humans. Uh, the company will then come to the FDA and present this non-clinical information, uh, and we allow a drug to be uh, investigated in humans through an IND. In early clinical trials, uh, we look at pharmacology, do dose escalation trials to find uh, the, maxim the maximal dose or several doses that we feel could be further explored. And we move into the green section where we look at phase two studies, identifying maybe looking at two different doses to find the optimal dose to take into a larger trial. And then we really start to understand uh, evidence for efficacy in a large randomized therapeutic confirmatory trial, um, maybe with a survival endpoint uh, to move to a regular approval licensing application. This obviously is a step-by-step -step process that can take quite a long time. Now, what is happened in oncology is we've learned, as we've learned more about the biology of the disease, is we've moved more into a seamless 
development paradigm. And what it has done is really collapsed um, that sort of pharmacologic, therapeutic, exploratory uh, clinical development. Uh, and this has been possible in oncology because we have an early clinical endpoint of benefit called response rate, the percentage of patients whose tumor shrinks. And so with the advent of the accelerated approval pathway, which we will talk about, it may be that there's such a, a significant uh, uh, signal of efficacy through response rate and early clinical endpoint that we can actually bring that product for review uh, in a licensing application for an NDA or new drug application and granted accelerated approval based on this early endpoint and, and enough safety data to understand the drug, expediting the access to patients for this therapy that may provide benefit over existing therapies. And then we further explore in the post-marketing setting, this larger confirmatory trial set, exploring more safety, verifying uh, the efficacy, uh, and eventually granting it regular approval uh, once those trials are completed. So we really have changed how we develop drugs and regulate drugs in cancer. I mentioned briefly uh, the idea of an accelerated versus a regular approval pathway. And indeed, there's two approval pathways in the United States, uh, regular or accelerated approval. And which pathway uh, one takes is really dependent on the endpoint uh, of the study, uh, the magnitude of that result, the disease context, and whether there's an unmet need, how many available treatments there are, and whether this is a larger effect than available treatments among other considerations. So it's not just about the endpoint. When we think about regular approval, we think about endpoints that are typically survival, uh, they could be symptom or functional benefit, uh, or an established surrogate. And these are usually larger randomized trials that have larger safety databases. Uh, importantly, when you're granted regular approval based on, the, on these larger uh, sets of, of evidence, uh, we do not require a comparative efficacy requirement. So that is to say that the drug simply needs to be shown to, to be safe and effective, as safe and effective as an available FDA approved therapy. So this allows for non-inferiority trials, which are used quite a bit actually outside of oncology. Another thing that is sometimes misunderstood, especially for, uh, for cancer, is that overall survival is not required. A benefit in overall survival is not required for us to grant approval to a drug. It can show benefit uh, based on, um, on tumor-based measurements, as we'll talk about. Accelerated approval, to get into this uh, a bit more, is an expedited program that was developed in 1992 in the era of the HIV uh, epidemic to try to expedite the delivery of therapies with early clinical data that appeared to provide uh, a benefit over available therapy. So for accelerated approval, it needs to be a severe and life-threatening disease there still needs to be substantial evidence of efficacy and safety, but that efficacy could be based on an earlier clinical endpoint that's reasonably likely uh, to predict clinical benefit. But because there's, it's earlier in development, as I showed you with the prior slide, there's less safety data, there's a more, little bit more uncertainty, and therefore we often require post-marketing confirmatory trials, which will add to the evidence and verify the benefit. Uh, and importantly, if that, those trials are not conducted, their requirements, if they're not conducted or if the results do not verify benefit, that accelerated approval can be withdrawn from the market. Now, as we get into the idea of the strengths and limitations of, of efficacy endpoints, uh, since we're using oncology as an example, I wanna walk you through uh, our oncology endpoints so that you understand a, a bit more about the typical natural history. So on this slide, you can see that this is tumor size. These black uh, blotches are, are, is a tumor uh, in a patient's body. Uh, you can see that at the initiation of therapy for a trial, it will be a certain size, and that's called the baseline size of the, of the tumor. After about eight to 12 weeks, um, and this is actually true in, in clinical practice oftentimes, we will rescan the patient and evaluate the size of the tumor to see if the therapy is working. If the, if the tumor has shrunk a significant amount, 30%, we call that an objective response rate. So we have an early clinical endpoint um, that we can use for accelerated approval. And indeed, that's the most common accelerated approval endpoint, and it occurs very quickly. As you can see, unfortunately, the natural history of most solid tumors, especially metastatic solid tumors, is that they will 
continue to grow oftentimes through therapy or when they'll become refractory to a therapy and unfortunately grow to a size greater than it was at baseline and that's called progression. The endpoints including time to progression or progression-free survival, uh, either patients that have progressed or have died. And then after progression, the natural history is that the tumor may continue to grow, may actually grow in different places around the body causing metastatic disease, likely causing symptoms and morbidity, which we can certainly measure as endpoints, as I'll mention. And then, unfortunately, for, for many patients with metastatic solid tumors, uh, the, the natural history of their disease is it often results in death due to the tumor. Now, here I have written overall survival as the endpoint. And I just want to touch on that. We're not uh, using the endpoint disease-specific survival. We're not measuring only those events that were specifically deaths due to the disease. And there's a reason for that. It's because it's pretty hard to attribute someone's death to metastatic cancer versus to some other comorbidity oftentimes. Typically when a patient dies, um, you know, they may die from heart failure, they may die from pneumonia, they may die from many, many things that could be related to the cancer but may not be specifically related to the cancer itself. So there's the that problem. The other reason though why overall survival is useful in oncology is because our, our drugs are actually um, have significant side effects and some of them actually can be can, can result in death. Um, so it is actually a bit of a safety endpoint as well. So imagine a therapy that does a pretty good job uh, at, at treating the, uh, the tumor and delaying the tumor growth and there's some delay in death and therefore a survival benefit, a disease-free survival benefit, or sorry, a disease-specific survival benefit. But if the drug is so toxic that it's also causing deaths toxic due to toxicity early, that may uh, make the drug not show a benefit in a randomized trial because the toxicity uh, is overwhelming uh, the incremental efficacy. So uh, overall survival is an important endpoint in oncology um, both because it it's, doesn't take attribution into effect and because it is a bit of a signal uh, regarding safety as well. So when I think about an efficacy endpoint result in a cancer drug submitted to the FDA, I usually think about it in three ways. I think about the endpoint, what was measured, what outcome is measured in this trial? Is it a tumor-based outcome? Is it a, a symptom or functional outcome, which is more rare? or is it overall survival, and how clinically meaningful is that particular outcome? But I also think about how accurately it is being measured. What are the measurement characteristics of this endpoint? And should I be concerned that there's challenges with accuracy or reproducibility or variability of the measure? And very importantly, how susceptible is that to bias? How objective is the measure? Um, and, and that's very important, as I'll show you. Finally, after I understand what's measured and, and, and the characteristics of how it's measured, I think about the effect. How big of an effect is this? What's the magnitude of effect? And put that in the context of the disease and available therapies. So just a quick slide on sort of interpretation. Um, I think of uh, variability and bias as related in some ways to how much interpretation is required to, for the endpoint to be um, met, for the event to occur. And here I have uh, from low to high, uh, my impression of sort of four examples of cancer endpoints that require increasing levels of interpretation and therefore have increasing risk for, for bias and variability. As I mentioned, survival is a useful endpoint, um, not only in, in its clinical meaningfulness, but in the fact that it has very little variability and very little bias and very little challenge in interpretation. So it is, it's a gold standard endpoint for, for those reasons. But as we think about tumor measurement, we do have to interpret that the target lesion has increased by 20%. So there's sort of measurement error issue. We have to be careful about how frequently we are assessing the tumor measures and that they're symmetric uh, between the arms. And so there's some challenges there. Even more challenging is when the tumor itself isn't actually well circumscribed and measurable. So bone disease, like in prostate cancer, you can't really measure it on a CT scan. In fact, we have to use bone scans, which are even more variable and challenging to interpret. And so there's even more, uh, I think, variability and bias in that endpoint. Finally, there are endpoints that include clinical events that are driven by clinician decision-making. And these are perhaps the, the most uh, open to bias and variability. So one example is skeletal-related events, events that occur because of metastasis in the bone, 
Um, one of the, the events is uh, pain that's so severe that you need to give radiation therapy as palliative treatment. And you have to think about what needs to occur before that event occurs. An investigator needs to hear that the patient is having pain, assess the patient and believe that the pain is focal, possibly get an imaging scan to make sure that they think the pain is due to a cancer versus something else, and then get the radiation oncologist to treat the patient. So there's a lot of decision-making along the way, and each decision could potentially uh, be prone to bias. So in, in, in essence, with endpoints themselves, they have multiple characteristics, and there's really no free lunch. There's no uh, perfect endpoint. Um, there are strengths and limitations for each, even survival. And as you look at overall survival in this slide, you see that it is very clinically meaningful, perhaps the most meaningful endpoint. It has a very low risk of bias and great measurement characteristics, as I've described. But the feasibility of this endpoint in contemporary cancer drug development is increasingly challenged. Uh, number one, it takes a long time in a large trial and requires randomization um, because it is the final event uh, in the natural history of the disease. But we'll talk about other reasons why contemporary drug development with very high early signals of benefit with response rate make it a challenging trial uh, to not allow patients on the alternative arm getting regular therapy to cross over and have access to that investigational therapy, which can really dilute a survival result. Tumor endpoints are very feasible, commonly used, uh, and you know they're also used in clinical practice, as I mentioned. You know we get scans uh, for patients to follow them along to see whether or not our standard treatments are working. They have a kind of a lower risk of bias, not quite as low as low as overall survival, for reasons I mentioned. There is some measurement challenges and variability associated with the endpoint, but we do have source validation and verification of the result because we can look at the CT scans. Uh, with an independent reviewer. And I think there's this sort of ongoing debate about how clinically meaningful tumor-based endpoints are. Um, so I gave it a plus or minus. This is my opinion, but you know, as a, as a practicing oncologist, it is not, it is a quite a meaningful uh, moment uh, in a patient's life when you unfortunately have to tell them that their tumor scan has progressed and uh, they are going to have to be taken off the therapy that they've been benefiting from for a year or so. It is meaningful to some degree, although, of course, it's not a direct measure of survival or symptoms or function. Symptoms and functional outcomes are obviously very meaningful to patients, so they're quite clinically meaningful. I think they can, can be incorporated into clinical trials using either patient-reported outcomes, uh, potentially wearable devices increasingly, but there is some risk for bias, uh, especially with patient-reported outcomes, which are more subjective measures unclear exactly what the magnitude or existence of this bias is in cancer specifically, uh, but it is, uh, you know, certainly a challenge. I will say that there's sometimes calls uh, that we should approve drugs based on symptom improvement alone, uh, but my thought about that is that while symptom improvement would be a very impressive um, a complementary uh, piece of evidence to uh, a tumor-related uh, endpoint, if all you have is a symptom improvement and there's no evidence that the tumor has been affected, uh, then it raises questions as to whether the mechanism of the drug is something other than anti-tumor activity. And, and we are really regulating cancer-directed therapies. And it's important because we're accepting a higher level of toxicity for these therapies. So if what we're really looking at is a supportive care medication, which is really just palliating symptoms but not affecting the tumor, we are gonna have a very different threshold for safety. So that's important to think about. Finally, there's clinical outcomes that we can reduce that are sort of morbid uh, procedures, like I mentioned in, in skeletal related events, or maybe reducing the need for steroids and, and brain tumors, et cetera. They are certainly clinically meaningful. I think they're relatively feasible to assess, but I think, again, when, when this event is driven by a somewhat subjective decision by a clinician, we can have a risk of bias. So no free lunch, uh, there's pluses and minuses to endpoints. So to wrap up how I look at efficacy endpoints, we talked about how important it is to understand what's being measured and, and how clinically meaningful that is. But it's also critical to understand the measurement characteristics and be aware of bias and, 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 and the ability of the, uh, of the measure to come up with an accurate result. And I do want to touch on how much. So when we look at the, at the magnitude of effect from the result, 
Certainly large magnitudes of effects are great, and they can certainly also overcome some of the uncertainty about whether it's really going to be meaningful to patients. So for instance, progression-free survival. Delaying the progression of a tumor for only two months or one and a half months uh, is not impressive um, because we're not sure if that's gonna mean anything to patients. However, when you delay a tumor for a year uh, or eight months or 12 months in, in a tumor that normally uh, progresses in two or three months, uh, you know, you start to feel more comfortable that's really going to be meaningful to patients. Conversely, small magnitudes can even, uh, you know, make an overall survival result meaningless. And so, you know, a seven day or, or one week, two week uh, median survival benefit in a setting of significant toxicity uh, may not be enough for, for an approval. I would also mention that even the, uh, the strongest endpoint like survival, if you have a large magnitude of effect, but there's some uncertainty given the fact that maybe the tumor measures aren't really in line with that survival benefit, you do need to make sure that you at least think about whether or not the effect that you see is due to the drug or some confounding influence or bias. It doesn't mean just because you have a large result that it's due to the drug and not something else. And so what are some of those things, especially for time to event endpoints, the time it takes a tumor to do something, uh, whether that be progress or lead to death. Other than the drug, there's all sorts of things that can cause uh, one arm to live longer than another uh, that has nothing to do with the drug. It could be that one arm has an imbalance in uh, you know, good prognostic factors. So it's a, it's a slower growing tumor just naturally. It could be that the demographics are imbalanced and that you know, these are younger patients or higher socioeconomic status or they have very few comorbidities. Um, increasingly, it could be that there's an imbalance in subsequent therapies because there's so many more therapies available that are effective in, in cancer now. Maybe more patients got, uh, you know, an effective therapy on one arm versus the other. This is why randomization is so critical for time to event endpoints like survival, because it is the best that we have to balance not only the known prognostic factors and other confounders, but the unknown, things that we don't even know about. Maybe it's you know poor care at one site versus another, et cetera. I want to touch on the benefit of response rate as a important endpoint, an increasingly important endpoint in cancer drug development. And it has everything to do with what I just said, assurance that the effect that you see is due to the drug versus something else. Uh, in cancer, um, solid tumors, metastatic solid tumors, for the vast amount, majority of disease states, tumors do not shrink on their own. Tumors inexorably grow unless you intervene with something that's effective. And so if you see uh, a tumor shrink uh, after the initiation of a therapy um, in the absence of some other therapy that was given, uh, you have a higher certainty, a high certainty, I would say that the tumor reduction is due to treatment. And so this allows the patient to be their own control. And so this is why single arm trials can be used uh, if you use response rate. And that's so important because increasingly in, in uh, cancer drug development, we're identifying smaller and smaller populations through biomarkers through in vitro diagnostics uh, that it's becoming increasingly challenging to, to find enough patients to randomize. That's one problem. And then the other problem is a loss of equipoise, which I'll talk later about um, as to whether or not you can even sort of ethically uh, conduct a trial uh, with the survival benefit or with the survival endpoint. And maybe I'll just give you a little history as to, as to how this is, is happening. So back in the 1970s uh, in cancer uh, therapeutics, we had few therapies, um, really, uh, and this is really the 60s and the 70s, uh, tumor shrinkage or response rate was used uh, frequently as, as an efficacy endpoint for approval um, for single agents. And then uh, in the 80s, they started to put uh, therapies together, and we're getting some incremental benefits of maybe 10 or 20% of patients having some radiographic uh, tumor responses. But this was in a setting of increasing and increasing toxicity, and not a great uh, set of supportive care medications at that time either. And so, uh, you know, it was really thought after discussion that um, ideally in these, at, at this time at least, uh, the outcome should be a direct clinical benefit, a randomized trial with survival which became kind of the, the common design in the 80s, 90s, and even into the 2000s. And this occurred until 
science began to advance and things really changed. And I think this was a pivotal moment for what we're calling precision medicine or targeted therapies, where the New England Journal uh, report of MATNIB in interferon refractory CML was reported that 53 out of 54 patients had a complete hematologic response. And, and so that is a super high response rate, right? A, a tumor reduction uh, that is just was unheard of. And uh, Dr. Drucker and his colleagues wrote that our, their results demonstrated the potential for the development of anti-cancer drugs based on the specific molecular abnormality present in human cancer. And that, of course, heralded well what has happened uh, subsequently over the last you know, 20 years. And you know, what has happened, as you see those sorts of response rates in, in the earlier clinical trials, has really forced that change in the drug development paradigm in cancer to more of a seamless oncology design and it has challenged equipoise for large trials. So when I talked about clinical equipoise, what I meant is that when you have equipoise, there's uncertainty in whether one arm is going to win or not. You have enough uncertainty in that investigational drug that you feel that it is ethical uh, to run that trial. And so what early sign of clinical benefit uh, allows you enough equipoise to run a trial? You know, back, uh, you know, years ago when we were looking at oxaliplatin and, and, and cytotoxic chemotherapies, you know, a 10% response rate uh, where we may have given accelerated approval, that was a decent enough amount of uncertainty to, to say, yeah, we need a randomized trial to confirm that that level of response rate is going to confer benefit. But in the contemporary drug development paradigm with things like curzotinib for non-small cell lung cancer, therapies that are targeted at enriched population with a target that this drug specifically will address, you're seeing response rates that are 50, 60, 70% with durations that are longer and side effect profiles that are often better. And so equipoise has been a challenge. And this just continues. Uh, these are just in at least non-small cell lung cancer, the many, uh, or sorry, this is across cancers. These are many targeted agents in comparison with sort of chemotherapy, typically twice the response rate um, certainly, you know, 20, 30%, 40% higher response rates for these targeted agents. And in addition to the loss of equipoise based on really large signals in, of early clinical endpoints, we're also seeing that our populations available to randomized trials shrinking and shrinking. So this is a, a great slide by my former colleague, Pidon Blumenthal, that showed, you know, non-small cell lung cancer 20 years ago was thought of as a, as a single disease. And as we understood the biologic underpinnings and genetic uh, drivers of these cancers, uh, we were able to identify, science was able to identify, small subsets of this that were able to be targeted by uh, drugs that address that specific mutation. And now we have, you know, 1% of lung cancer, uh, and that's a lot smaller population to be able to randomize to a trial. One may ask, and it has been asked, whether approving drugs based on tumor-based endpoints like progression-free survival uh, or response rate is really helping patients in the long run. And, and a great study was uh, put out in the New England Journal last year uh, by uh, folks of the NIH regarding um, uh, how non-small cell lung cancer uh, survival, two-year survival, had increased um, higher than the incidence of the disease has been decreasing, suggesting that um, that therapeutic advances, specifically in precision medicine over this time frame, um, really did drive uh, an improvement in the whole disease as a, as a whole. You might say, well, maybe that is just because people are smoking less and there's less incidence of lung cancer. But in fact, when we looked at, or they looked at small cell lung cancer, uh, which is a, uh, a cancer that unfortunately has had very little drug development or drug approval uh, in the same time frame, they did not see that uh, degree of improvement in survival. So I'm going to move on now to how we are sort of moving more towards incorporating patients and thinking about patients in drug development uh, and improving trials. So this is a slide by my colleague Teresa Mullen um, that I've adapted where, you know, the question is, is where and how, how do you involve patients during drug development? And so I think she suggests, and I agree, that you can incorporate patients all along the way from very early on before trials were even started to understand the disease natural history and what's important to patients and can you measure it. Uh, so it may be, you know, if there's certain symptoms that are important to patients, you would then need to identify a tool that you can measure it with. 
in the clinical studies area, there are two things we can address. Number one is how are we running trials right now? And could we make them more patient friendly? And then the second is when we heard what matters from patients in the translational phase, are there tools we can use in deploying clinical trials to assess complementary information on symptoms and tolerability and functional outcomes? And then how can we incorporate these, this patient-related data in our FDA reviews and the pre-market review? And then finally, even in the post-marketing setting, when the drug is out on the market, um, you know, can we communicate this, this patient-centric data out to further uh, sort of inform the drug's risks and benefits? And is there, are there easier ways to generate even more data in the post-marketing setting to understand the drug in, in the generalized population? Most of our work actually has been up front, and I think we've made some strides that I just wanted to mention. So when you talk to patients, and we have in what we call patient-focused drug development meetings that are formal meetings with the FDA, but also just in my everyday work in, in, in a lot of the uh, sort of conferences that I attend, I speak to a lot of patients, I speak to a lot of advocates, um, and really what matters to patients, in addition to controlling their tumor and, uh, and living longer, is they want to know how they're going to feel and function better before they take a therapy. How did patients uh, experience that treatment while they're taking it? And it has a lot to do, I think, with what they're going to give up for, for the benefit they're going to receive. What's the quality of their progression-free survival? So it's, it's been a long-asked question and, and typically sort of drove the health to quality of life field. So there's a big interest in measuring symptoms and function better now. Why now? I think one of the drivers is that there's so many more effective therapies that are approved and it'd be uh, better to have information uh, to make an informed choice where there's two choices to be had. I think there's technological improvements that are making this easier, whether that's electronic capture of surveys or patient reported outcomes on, on how they're experiencing symptoms. Uh, or whether it be more novel approaches to measuring function and activity like wearable devices, Fitbits, um, Apple Watches, et cetera. We have work uh, in both of those areas. Also, I think clinical care is actually starting to use patient reported outcomes more uh, to monitor patients and intervene and, and provide supportive care, specifically symptom side effects, sort of patient reported outcome measures that have been advanced by Ethan Bash at the University of North Carolina and others. And there are new PRO instruments like the PRO-CTCAE by the National Cancer Institute, which are just more flexible libraries of specific patient-reported symptom questionnaires that you can custom tailor to the, to the drug that you're studying. So there's a lot of things that have come out recently that have helped advance this field. But when we're asked to use it, the FDA is asked to use sort of quality of life types of, uh, of measures, we really thought carefully about what was it that was going to help inform our regulatory decisions? Because as I mentioned, just because an endpoint or a measure in a trial is meaningful doesn't mean that it's a good endpoint from a measurement characteristic standpoint. So it has to be important to patients, but it also has to be sensitive uh, to informing the intervention that we're studying, whether, whether it's a drug or a biologic. And if we can find that, uh, it can inform our regulatory decisions. And so what we've done is created a core set of, of symptom and functional outcomes that we feel um, are a general starting point, a core set that, that we think could inform our trials. They include things like disease symptoms, uh, symptomatic, expected symptomatic adverse events, a global question about how bothered patients are about their side effects, a measure of physical function, and then a measure of, of how patients are able to work or, or, or enjoy their leisure activities. So it's a pretty narrow group of outcomes compared to larger health-related quality of life instruments and their disease modules. And what we hope to do is expand our palette of evidence when it comes in to the FDA for safety uh, and efficacy review. So what we do well now, what we've been talking about in blue is our standard uh, efficacy markers of survival, progression-free survival and overall response rate. We have uh, very good standardized safety data that are reported by clinicians uh, common terminology criteria for adverse events, or CTCAE safety data. It's very standardized. We, we know about dose modifications during a trial, and we know something about hospitalizations and ED visits and some of the sort of uh, healthcare utilization. So I think we can do better in yellow, but I also think we can add that core outcome set of symptom and functional outcomes that are sensitive to the intervention for, for a better totality of the evidence, get a better sense of quote, the quality of a patient's uh, treatment journey with respect to how they're functioning, how they're being able to take care of themselves, 
uh, and what sorts of symptoms and their impacts they're feeling. In addition to measures like patient reported outcomes and improving symptom and functional uh, measurement, we can and should and are making trials uh, more patient friendly. Um, we are certainly getting there. We've done some things like looked to broaden eligibility criteria to allow patients with a broader set of, of comorbidities uh, to enroll on trials. And we've had multiple collaborations uh, have been successful in that regard. We're looking to improve trial access and reduce disparities in the ability to, to get onto clinical trials. And there are several ways we can do that that I'll discuss. Um, some of the ways that we can get trials more out to patients is to improve digital health technology so that we can remotely assess patients so that they don't have to travel so far to get to clinical sites. And uh, that is called decentralized trials, so conducting trials closer to where patients live. And finally, you know, what role does just standard clinical care and, and learning healthcare systems play in our ability to deploy you know, more practical, pragmatic trials, even prospective randomized trials? All those things are being evaluated. So let's talk a little bit about what we're doing with evidence generation in the trial and real world settings. So a decentralized trial is a clinical investigation where either some or all of the trial related procedures and data acquisition take place at locations remote from the investigator. So we are trying to move some of the aspects of the clinical trial out closer to where the patients live. Now, there are lots of potential benefits to decentralized clinical trials. Uh, a lot of it centers around the reduced burden on patients. So many patients have to travel, you know, 50, 100, several hundred miles uh, if they live very remotely to the tertiary or quaternary healthcare centers that typically are clinical sites for trials. When you reduce the burden on patients, you can access more patients. You can improve accrual because there's a larger catchment area, which may make for faster trials and lower costs. You may keep patients on trial and decrease attrition because it's just easier to be uh, enrolled on that trial. Because of the remote assessments, they are not as onerous to, for the patient to go and, and have them assess going to the sites. So maybe you can have them more frequently. Uh, and in fact, maybe you can query them uh, in longer term follow-up and get some more long-term follow-up data easier. But I think one of the biggest benefits of DCT possibly is that we can access a wider swath of patients and therefore hopefully obtain a more diverse and representative population in our clinical trials that's more reflective of how these drugs will be used once they're uh, approved if they're deemed safe and effective. Well, look, there's so many benefits to decentralized clinical trials. Why have we not done it? What are the barriers? There must be some barriers. And I think probably one of the biggest barriers is uncertainty and risk aversion in the clinical trial uh, especially commercial clinical trial realm. And, and it's understandable. These trials are very expensive. Um, they have a lot of, um, of work and, and preceding science that are, that are packed into these single trials. Uh, and so understandably, sponsors know that this is the way that uh, drugs have been approved in the past and they're reticent to change things if it's been successful. Uh, there's also things that are sort of outside of of uh, our control, like jurisdictional state laws about telemedicine licensing, which, which could hamper decentralized trials. And then I think if you decentralize trials um, to a large extent, you may need to do some training uh, and certainly supervise these remote healthcare providers or other personnel. But I think really it is a lot about the uncertainty. You know, how will remote conduct affect uh, data in clinical trials? So, you know, that's the big question. You may have been seeing talks at various conferences about COVID-19 and what it has done to uh, existing clinical trials that, have, that were ongoing. And I think, you know, it's been termed the grand experiments and I think this is, this is accurate. It certainly is the silver lining to an otherwise terrible public health crisis because what it has done, it is, is forced industry, regulators, academics, uh, and, and even patients outside of their comfort zone to deploy rapidly these remote assessments that we've been talking about that are key to decentralized clinical trials. Because the risk of traveling and going to a site where there may be a high COVID rate because they were being hospitalized, uh, that risk outweighed the risk of changing what had been done uh, before. And so remote clinic visits through telemedicine, remote labs, remote imaging, remote administration, 
of investigational product and site monitoring were deployed um, so, or at least permitted across a wide range of trials during COVID. So what can we learn? And what we're going to be doing is, uh, is looking at that data as it comes into the FDA and we hope uh, that we'll learn uh, how to continue to deploy some of these remote assessments post COVID um, and, and deploy them in a way that maintains patient safety and, and maintains trial integrity. Another thing that has been looked at a lot is what's called real world data. Well, what is real world data? Real world data is data relating to patient's health status or the delivery of healthcare that's just routinely collected from a variety of sources that are not clinical trial sources. So this is electronic health records, it's claims data, it's disease registries, possibly patient generated data from, from apps and, and uh, iPhones and things like that, um, and mobile devices. So there's been a great deal of interest in this data and, and how can we use it to inform regulatory decision making. But I would you know, suggest, and I think this has been made clear by the FDA that real world data is not real world evidence. And so work needs to be done uh, to assure that we understand enough about real world data to allow it to be considered evidence um, that will uh, help us understand the risks and benefits uh, or other regulatory questions for medical products. Some of the ways that real world data uh, could be used and actually you know, are, are being used now are in the sort of low risk uh, areas where you really don't necessarily need you know, a significant understanding of, of uh, the attribution of the outcome to the drug, which is something I'll talk about. And that is you know, um, sort of understanding just the outcomes in general of certain populations uh, to characterize um, you know, what they look like in the real world. Um, Obviously, you can get important use data, what kinds of drugs are used in, in what kinds of ways, um, and that can be very important, even to monitor for things like drug shortages. Um, we can certainly look at safety in the real world, and we have done that um, through our Office of Surveillance and Epidemiology for, for several years now. But I think what's maybe the more cha bigger challenge is, is people are interested in using real world data to generate efficacy data, to generate data on uh, benefit outcomes that are related to, to the drug itself. And so that is where we uh, need to focus uh, most of our research. I think, you know, to sort of close what we're seeing, at least with respect to source data uh, and making trials more, more efficient and data acquisition more efficient is at least some shift uh, from traditional randomized controlled clinical trials, which, which really are protocol driven healthcare at, uh, at trial sites that have, you know, their prospective trials are randomized. They have a standard uh, assessment frequency of both for both uh, safety and efficacy. They're very highly monitored to keep data quality high, but they suffer for, from a, a narrow population and a challenge with generalizability. But we feel pretty comfortable and confident that the outcome in these traditional randomized clinical trials uh, is due to the drug versus confounding influences. The whole point is to reduce the effect of confounding influences. And you know, as we move down more towards routine healthcare, moving trials out more towards routine healthcare, we, we can decentralize at least some aspects of the randomized controlled trial, which is sort of the next step, which we talked about. It can still be a prospective randomized trial. We can still have a, a standard assessment frequency, but we can do it remotely. We can still monitor the trial for, for uh, data integrity, um, and I think maybe the population will be broader as, as, a, as, a, as a benefit. Even further along to routine healthcare, we could actually deploy a randomized prospective clinical trial in sort of more of a routine healthcare situation where there are very little to no standard assessments and patients are just being treated and sort of followed along as they normally would. Clearly less monitoring, clearly a broader population, but you know, you lose some control and, and confounding influences could, could be an issue. Obviously, this, this may also require that uh, these are already approved drugs or there may be other, some, some other considerations. Finally, what we just talked about is true real world data, which is really about just looking at information that's just been sort of routine, routinely collected uh, from a healthcare system. This is all routine healthcare data. Currently, it's mostly retrospective it's almost always not randomized. There is certainly no standard assessments. It's not monitored. There's a decent amount of missing data. 
Um, it's certainly the broadest population has its big benefit, but when you're looking at things like time to event endpoints, like we mentioned, survival, um, the major limitation of real world data at this time is that it lacks randomization. And we have a very hard time interpreting any kind of survival difference between a real world cohort and a trial cohort based on our high uncertainty that, that those populations are balanced from known and unknown prognostic factors. So I think uh, moving forward, what we're very interested in is, is identifying opportunities in the real world to create some kind of real world response rate, some kind of understanding that's, that's uh, you know, entered into the system that the patient received the drug, their tumor uh, was, you know, was reduced uh, by by you know a significant amount, and and the clinician felt like it was a response uh, that would be helpful because as I said, if we're going to use single arm cohorts, uh, the one endpoint that we feel comfortable with with respect to assuring that the outcome is due to the drug is tumor shrinkage, and that's just not an endpoint we have right now in the real world. So in conclusion. Uh, both regular and accelerated approval uh, require substantial evidence of efficacy uh, in the setting of, a, of acceptable safety and, and whichever you use has to do with the context and the endpoint that you use. I mentioned that no efficacy endpoint is perfect. Um, we take lots of things into consideration when we look at efficacy. Uh, that includes the meaningfulness of the outcome, the measurement characteristics of the outcome, how large of an effect, uh, the safety and also the disease context and available therapies. I want to hit home that randomization is so critical, uh, not just in oncology, but in any therapeutic area where your outcome is the time it takes from randomization for something to happen. When you have a time to have an endpoint that's driven by progression of a disease, um, like survival and cancer, um, we need to have confidence that the effect is due to the intervention. And currently the best way to do that is randomization to assure that the arms are balanced. I would say there's significant momentum uh, to make trials in general more patient-centric. That's both by assessing and, and measuring more sort of patient uh, uh, experience data, such as symptom and functional outcomes, but also the trials themselves need to be more patient-friendly. Expanding eligibility so more patients can participate, moving trials more out to where patients live so that they can be less burdened by the trial itself. And finally, I think there is emerging opportunity for, for more efficient evidence generation. Um, I like the idea of prospective randomized trials that are conducted uh, you know, in a more sort of decentralized or even more practical, pragmatic uh, way. I think real world data, true real world data, which is not prospective and not randomized, um, you know, is currently limited both when we look at efficacy. With that, I will end. I really appreciate the opportunity to, to speak with you about um, topics that I I really enjoy. Um, I want to acknowledge uh, my colleagues and friends uh, at the FDA across centers uh, in the Oncology Center of Excellence, uh, particularly Dr. Pazders, Thea Ray, Tammy Kim, Gidon Blumenthal, Michelle Botnagar, and Donna Rivera, um, who all contributed um, to input in many of these topics.